if we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving, as we heard in, in Lydia's beautiful reading of Pablo Neruda. Si no pudimos ser unánimes moviendo tanto nuestras vidas, tal vez no hacer nada una vez. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and perhaps do nothing for once, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. If I were a physician, wrote the Christian thinker Soren Kierkegaard, and if I were allowed to prescribe just one remedy for all the ills of the modern world, I would prescribe silence. For even if the word of God were proclaimed in the modern world, how could one hear it with so much noise? When we fall still and listen, when we allow our flashing reactions and endless strivings to settle, and we put our trust and rest in the embrace of, of the divine beyond us. What do we hear? What do we hear of the Holy One speaking within us? Of the Holy One speaking among us? And of the Holy One speaking beyond us? And from whom do we hear that voice, those voices of our still-speaking God at work in our times amidst all of its troubles? And are those voices still cries in the wilderness? Are we listening? This Sunday in the ancient story cycle of our church, we have the opportunity to hear anew this story of the Pentecost. The story of Pentecost occurs after the followers of the way of Jesus have passed through the experiences of bearing witness to crucifixion and to resurrection and to ascension. We can't understand Pentecost without remembering that is coming out of these experiences, and especially the experience of crucifixion. Jesus suffered the state-sanctioned violence and terror of the Roman Empire, which was a fate that his Jewish disciples all feared for themselves. It was all too common of a way for the empire to assert its dominance in the name of peace and order. Crucifixion, I should mention, ultimately kills through asphyxiation. Its victims can't breathe. For the faithful, we know that through Christ, God, God's self, the creator, sustainer, and redeemer of all and everything in the universe, joins creation in bearing the wounds of our sinful alienation from each other, from ourselves, from our true God and our true purpose. And for the faithful, we know that through resurrection and ascension, that, that the power and love of God overcomes the powers of death and of crucifixion, breaking through all of that and blossoming out to embrace all and everything in universal grace. And for the first followers of the way of Jesus who were witnesses to these things, their purpose then became to share the good news of this and to invite those who heard to receive it in their hearts and so undergo what is called metanoia and aphasis. Often this is translated as repentance and forgiveness. Metanoia in Greek means something like a shift in our fundamental understanding, a going beyond our current sense of ourselves and the world. The word that's used in Hebrew means a turnaround, to turn around. And the result of this is forgiveness, the experience of forgiveness from God, a restoration or a reunion with the transcendent source of all being. And when we experience this, even just taste it, we realize that grace is simply the reality of God, 
which is offered freely and abundantly, as God offers being to all beings, to everyone, at all times. And this compels us to reverence and gratitude and to love. It also can cause us to be more attuned to the suffering in the world that is due to our distance from God, exemplified by the crucifixion, and and to be more inclined to acts of courage to relieve that suffering and to share the good news that this suffering need not be so. The story of Pentecost is, is the story of the Holy Spirit suddenly filling and inflaming the disciples for this task. And one astonishing result of this is that they found that they could speak in ways that anyone could understand. Language was no longer a barrier. But what was still a barrier, turns out, was people's willingness to hear. And the disciples were unsparing in their message. They were very clear about calling on people who themselves helped to crucify Jesus, to hear the good news and to undergo this metanoia and receive forgiveness and to be transformed in the image of God's grace and to give up these ways that lead to crucifixion. And those who did hear this message and receive this message, we are told, were pierced to the heart. Or as one translation has it, they were conscience smitten. And this allowed a huge silence to interrupt their sadness of never understanding themselves and of threatening themselves with death. And in that silence, they finally could hear God. Throughout history, the people, it seems, who tend to understand the message of Christianity the best, have been those who well know what it is like to stand in fear of crucifixion in its many forms. And it is for the rest of us to listen more to them than to ourselves. And at present, we are in the midst of of a kind of crisis that is turning the volume up on the crises that have long been festering in our nation and our world. And this week past, yet another black person in America was crucified, George Floyd. Our country's original sin has survived generations. It survived wars and pandemics because we have not sincerely repented of it. And we need not fear that repentance. That's part of this good news. Because we know that God is a God of grace who wants to join us in our condition and move us beyond the limitations of history. And so let me cede the rest of my time and of your gracious attention Uh, to voices greater than my own. This is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I must say tonight that a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice and humanity. Now, are these voices still voices crying in the wilderness? And this is from Ibram X. Kendi, uh, from the end of his book, Stamped from the Beginning, uh, which is a, a history of racist thought in America, uh, which makes very clear that the problem is not racist ideas, but policies that then ideas serve to justify, beliefs serve to justify. This is from the end of the book. Any effective solution to eradicating American racism 
must involve Americans committed to anti-racist policies, seizing and maintaining power over institutions, neighborhoods, counties, states, and nations, the world. An anti-racist America can only be guaranteed if principled anti-racists are in power, and then anti-racist policies become the law of the land, and then anti-racist ideas become the common sense of the people, and then the anti-racist common sense of the people holds these anti-racist leaders and policies accountable. And that day is sure to come. No power lasts forever. There will come a time when Americans will realize that the only thing wrong with black people is that they think something is wrong with black people. There will come a time when racist ideas will no longer obstruct us from seeing the complete and utter abnormality of racial disparities. There will come a time when we will love humanity, when we will gain the courage to fight for an equitable society for our beloved humanity, knowing intelligently that when we fight for humanity, we are fighting for ourselves. There will come a time, and maybe, just maybe, that time is now. And so on behalf of that beloved humanity, I invite us all to to pause and to hear the huge silence that might interrupt our sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. As Neruda says, perhaps the earth can teach us, as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. And so, my friends, let us be still and listen. I give thanks to God.